So Lada Aguiana was a former slave who gained his freedom and became a staunch abolitionist. This is an autobiography, so he is telling his life story. But he isn't just telling this because he felt like sitting down and reliving the most traumatic events of his life. He writes this because he is an abolitionist. You have to remember that during this time period, there wasn't mass media. He couldn't have taken a camera around and exposed what was happening in the African slave trade. And many people didn't really know. If you weren't directly involved in it, you got the propaganda about it, but that's really it. So writing lets those people hear a firsthand account of the horrors that these people endured. Hopefully it helped change their minds about the whole situation. So we're only going to cover some excerpts from this novel, but let's start with chapter two. One of the things that I find most interesting about this account of slavery is that it starts when he was actually kidnapped. Unfortunately, kidnappings were a common thing. They were so common that when the adults had gone to hunt and farm, the children would post a lookout to watch for slave catchers. Um, now, slavery in Africa was, for the most part, different than the chattel slavery that was practiced in the United States. It was more like people were forced into being servants, but it still wasn't good. So Ulata was separated from his sister, whom he was captured with, and was plotting his escape to return home after he was sold to his first master. He actually killed a chicken accidentally at that place and was so afraid of being punished that he decided to run away early. So he ran and he hid in the woods, and the people who were looking for him kept talking about how he would die if he tried to run home because it was so far away. Eventually, under the cover of darkness, he went back to his master's house, and he hid in a shed. When he was discovered, though, his master just gave him a really stern talking to. But he was then again sold for a brief time, was able to reunite with his sister. But that was only for a day, and it was devastating to him to lose her once again. He makes the commentary that slavery destroys humanity by ripping families apart. He is then sold to a woman who has bought him to become a companion to her son. She actually treats him really well, and he sits down and eats with the family. He's actually somewhat happy here, but he is again sold, and that is when he gets taken to the slave ship. So this is the first time since he's been captured that he's in a place where he can't communicate. No one understands his language, and he doesn't understand theirs. This is also the first time that he sees white people, and he is afraid that they are demons that are going to eat him. His assessment of them doesn't get much better as he watches them mistreat the other slaves and even each other. He accuses them of brutal cruelty. He is also fascinated with the ship and thinks it moves by magic. I mean, think about it. If you didn't know how gears and sails and anchors work, it does seem magical how this thing floats through the water and then stops when you want it to. So then he is brought to the slave market, and they are told by the over older slaves from the plantations that they were there to work, they weren't going to be eaten, and they would see many of their countrymen once they came ashore. What Olada marvels at when he gets there is the people on horseback, and he fears them as some sort of magical beings. And then he goes on to recount the horrors of the slave market and how families are literally ripped apart, and the buyers descend upon the people for sale, and he asks these good Christians how they could condone such behavior. When he is eventually sold, he is taken to Virginia, and here he sees a woman who is wearing an iron muzzle while she cooks in the kitchen as he's being led through to go and fan the master of the house while he sleeps. This kid is terrified, and as he fans the sleeping man, he notices a watch on the mantel. Again, this is like magic to him, and he becomes paranoid that the watch is watching his every move and will report back to his master if he does anything wrong. Luckily, he is soon seen by a former Royal Navy Lieutenant, Pascal, and he purchases Ulata and takes him to England, where Ulata is fascinated by the falling snow and thinks for a bit that it's salt. Uh, at this point, he also renames Ulata Equiano to Gustavus Vasa, before that, he had been called both Michael and Jacob, but think about that for a minute. He didn't take on a different name because he chose to. His name was taken from him, and another name was forced upon him. So on this ship, he meets a guy named Richard Baker, who was an American and who was actually from a slave-owning family. But due to the hardships that Olada and Richard were going through together, they became great friends and actually remained friends until Richard died in 1759. He actually started to teach Ulata English, but even this friendship was not enough to quell Ulata's fears, and the crew still thought it was funny to tell him they were going to eat him. 
Richard also told him about Christianity and Olada was amazed at the customs like not making sacrifices and actually washing their hands. As he continues on the ship, there are several boys his age there. And at one point, Olada and the other boys are made to fight one another for entertainment. He was then encouraged to continue his fighting by the sailors and the captain. So moving on to chapter five, Olada eventually has been baptized and instructed in Christianity. So he begins to wonder if this new slavery that he's sold into is some sort of punishment for his sins. And he accepts some of it as just being God's will. So he is being sent to the West Indies and Olada has tried everything he could to escape, but he keeps getting taken advantage of. People are promising to help him to go and then stealing his money. And he is stuck on this journey as a prisoner, which is so different from how he had been treated on the boats before. However, he is eventually bought by Mr. King, who is a nice man and doesn't beat his slaves. If they misbehave or try to escape, he just sells them. So King runs goods between the West Indies and Philly. And basically he lends out his slaves to others. But he does pay them, granted it's not much, and he tries to intercede whenever they're being mistreated. So Olada was taught to do bookkeeping and was actually in charge of an estate that used slave labor. Even though the slaves on that plantation were treated kindly, Olada was still forced to participate in the slave trade against other Africans, which is cruelty in its own way. He details some more instances of cruelty to slaves in this chapter, including rape and torture. He constantly asks how these people can answer to God as Christians and how can they treat other humans so abominably. Remember that his purpose is to abolish slavery. And when he's asking these questions, it's more to the people who are not directly handling plantation. The people who were doing these unspeakable things were already too far gone. The cruelty, Olada claims, is why so many slaves died and the demand for new slaves to replace them was so incredibly high. Now we're going to take a big leap forward into chapter 11, where Olada is almost killed on a boat to Cadiz as it hits a rock and starts to sink. But he's actually not scared. Uh, like before, when he is asking if this is a punishment for his sins, he figures if it's God's will, it will be done. So at this point in time, he's owned by Dr. Irving, even though he had gained his freedom in England for a short while. And Dr. Irving wanted to buy a plantation in Jamaica, and he wanted Olado to go with him. Olado agreed because he wanted to help convert the natives, which I found interesting because conversion has originally been forced on him. So I find it interesting that he wanted to convert others. But under this master, as with Mr. King, Olada is again engaged in the slave trade and buys slaves to work Dr. Irving's new plantations. He also has dealings with local native tribes and notes how they acted mostly with decorum, even if it was different than Europeans. But there was one instance where the Indian governor and his friends got drunk and stole one of the other chief's hats after slapping him. Dr. Irving takes off and leaves Olada with this group about to explode on each other. And Olada thinks quick and turns to threatening them with the wrath of God. And it worked and everyone settled down. Eventually, he is set free by Dr. Irving, but when he refuses to work for a captain of a ship, which he shouldn't have to because he's free, he is tied up on a mast and left there to hang all night. But an acquaintance of Olada's helps him actually escape that ship. But then he ends up on another ship that's run by John Baker, and he is mean and crazy and at one point threatens to blow up the ship. He ended up running into Dr. Irving again and finds out that all of the slaves had drowned trying to escape the sadistic overseer that Dr. Irving had hired after Ulata left. It's horribly disheartening given that Ulata had set a precedence of kindness to those who were enslaved, but in the end it didn't matter. So I hope you see how all of his recounting of his experiences goes towards his main goal of showing the people the horrors of slavery and hoping that they will then abolish that institution.